book of 2 Kings, and we're going to read an Old Testament story in 2 Kings and chapter 5, 2 Kings and chapter 5. And we're going to commence to read at the verse 1. 2 Kings chapter 5 and the verse 1. Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. The Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have uh, therewith sent Naaman my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. And it came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man does send me, send unto me a man to recover of his leprosy? Wherefore consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. And it was so when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot, and he stood at the door of the house of Elisha, and Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go wash in the Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth, And went away and said, Behold, I thought he would surely have come to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Are not Abana and Farfar, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? May not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, If the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather when he doth say to thee, wash and be clean? Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him and said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. Amen. And we know God will bless the public reading of his infallible and inerrant word. Let's unite in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your precious word. We want to thank you that your word is living and your word is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And Heavenly Father, I give myself afresh to you. I pray that you would cleanse me and sanctify me and pour your Holy Spirit upon me. I pray, Lord, that your presence would descend in greater power into this sanctuary that there would be more and more and more of your presence. And I pray, Lord, that you would come and stand amongst us. Thank you for what you're doing, Lord, in these days. Thank you for what you're going to do. 
Thank you, Lord, for not only in this corner, but we believe, Lord, over the entire nation, the island of Ireland and the two countries within it, that you are not going to look upon borders on this occasion, but rather, Lord, you are going to visit the 32 counties and you are going to do exceeding abundantly above all that we have ever asked or thought. So we pray, Lord, that our lives would be in line with you. and We pray that, Lord, we would be ready to receive the outpouring of thy Spirit on this country and on this land. So I pray that this night would be a contribution, Lord, to what you're going to do in revival in this land. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. There is a, a, Bertie said, there's a little crash at the back. So if you find that you're struggling with a child, it's much better just to be at peace. And then it lets other people hear the word of God as well because they're all distracted uh, if a little one's crying. So the facility's there for you, and if you would like it, please, please avail of it, and it's uh, good for everyone. I want to thank uh, Bertie for the opportunity to come along and minister tonight the Word of God. And we have really been uh, praying much along with you over the meetings here and what God has been doing. And uh, I've been very interested in recent days as to what God has been doing in the south of Ireland. I was just saying to Bertie beforehand, the south of Ireland, there's a great interest in uh, revival, a great interest in the work of God. And uh, there's been many people who are really crying out to the Lord for uh, revival. And so it's wonderful to know that there are churches in the south where God is really at work. And uh, I fear in the north here that we haven't quite caught up. It seems that we're out of kilter with what God is doing. We seem to have lost our way somewhere in the evangelical church uh, in Northern Ireland, but in the South, the little churches are definitely on cue with what God is doing, and they're certainly hearing God's voice. And I believe that as Duncan Campbell said in the 1960s, that there would be great uh, riots and unrest followed by a great revival on the island of Ireland. I believe that will happen, and it will shake uh, every person uh, regardless of background or culture. And so we continue to look, to pray, to trust and thank God for that. The title for the message tonight has been used by many in the past as three ducks in a dirty river. Three ducks in a dirty river. The story of Naaman, the great uh, warrior who had leprosy and whom God supernaturally healed. And I want to take time this evening to look at this interesting character, Naaman, in the Bible. The Bible introduces him, the Holy Spirit takes him as a character and focuses on him, on his life, and what had happened to him and how God wonderfully delivered and healed him. It commences with his great achievements. And perhaps there's someone in this meeting tonight and you have great achievements. There have been areas where you have been very successful, areas where you perhaps could feel an element of pride because of what you have done or where you were born or what you own. Well, he was very much of that ilk. And the Bible tells us that he was a great warrior. He was not only a warrior, but he was decorated. And uh, had he been in the British establishment, he would have rows and rows of medals. And you would have seen him walking on the Armistice Day. He would have been walking uh, in London with these load of, of uh, medals with his chest out uh, because he was extremely proud of these accomplishments, how he had fought uh, for the king and he had been very victorious in the battles. He was not only exalted, decorated, and a warrior, but unfortunately he was ignorant of the fact that God had given him those victories. And he's very, very typical of men and women today. Men and women who have success in their life are very quick to tell you of how they did it. They're very quick to tell you of how they maneuvered things and worked things and they accomplished these things. But the Bible gives us an insight 
a revelation into the life of individual men and women, even who are not Christians. Because it says in this first verse of chapter 5 that he was a great man with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance. You see, when this man went out to battle, it was the Lord that gave him the victory. It was the Lord that helped him to overcome the enemy. But he didn't see that. And he decided that it was him that had got the victory. That he was the one who was smart. I remember years ago being in a shop. My wife and I went in to buy clothes. And this man was behind the counter and we got to talk. And he turned around and he said, You know, I've never had a penny given to me. I've earned every cent I have. And when we were out of the shop, you, you know, you virtually wondered what he had got his head out of the shop uh, because he was so impressed with his own achievement that he had earned everything. He had done it himself. Maybe you're like that. Maybe that's the way you talk. That you have accomplished it all. Never acknowledging and never recognizing that the Lord who has given you life, the Lord who has given you eyes to see, who has given you ears to hear, and given you all the faculties and abilities and skills that you have, you have never knelt at your bedside to say to God, thank you for all the abilities and all the skills and all the enablings that you have given to me. In him we live and move and have our very being. And my friends, at any moment, God could take that thing that we call breath from you and I, and our life would cease to exist in this world. We have nothing to be proud of. And this man certainly had nothing to be proud of. But like so many others, he wore his badges, he wore his medals with great pride and with a chest out. But then we get an insight that brings everything into perspective for Naaman. Oh yes, he was in the presence of the king. He could go in and speak to the king. He was looked upon with jealousy by other people in the kingdom because of his achievements, because of his recognition. Ah, but the Bible says, but he was a leper. He had a problem. All his achievements, he had a problem. A leper. He had the dreaded disease, leprosy. And while today people with leprosy can be helped so much, in Bible times there was no cure for leprosy. And this man, despite all achievements, he now was stained. He now was condemned. He would ultimately be separated from all other people because leprosy demanded that you could not stay with people who were well. You were going to be isolated and separated. You know, leprosy in the Old Testament is always a picture of sin. And the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And tonight you and I are sinners simply because we have broken God's law. For that reason, you and I will die because the wages or the consequences of sin is death. You will not evade death. You will not avoid death. There are people who believe. I think Simon Cowell, if I remember rightly, is one of them, the star over in England, that he has left uh, strict instructions that his body is to be encased in liquid nitrogen and he's to be frozen stiff. Until the time whenever doctors can overcome death and bring them back to life again. Some people haven't as much money, so they just put their head in ice. The hope that they'll get a body to fit onto. 
It's a big investment. I'm not going to bother with it. You see, my dear friends, out of the 7 billion people on the earth tonight, 7 billion or thereabouts, the interesting thing is not one of them are going to evade death. You would imagine one of them would break through. You'd imagine somebody would have the right genes. Somebody would have the right makeup that could just avoid death and keep living. It doesn't happen. Why? Because all men are sinners and the wages of sin is death. It is a universal problem. And my friend, statistics for sin are terrible. One out of one will die. There was no known cure in these days, and Naaman knew it. No known cure. I've got a disease that's going to waste me away. I've got a disease that's going to eat my flesh until it drops off. And eventually I'll go to the grave. My dear friends, the Bible says, consider your ways. The Bible says, man dieth and wasteth away. Yea, man giveth up the ghost. But where is he? Oh, yes, you will die and you will give up the ghost. Your spirit man inside your body will leave your body at death. But here's the question that Job asked. Where will you be? I want to ask the young man here tonight with all the ambitions of youth and without any great disappointments in life yet and the world is your oyster and you have strength and ability and few disappointments and you see what you're going to achieve. I want to ask you, is there any place for God in your thinking? Because the young may die. You are just the right age to die. If you go to any local cemetery in our province or in all of Ireland, you will find that someone died at your age. Oh, you're just the right age to die. I know the old must die, but the young may die. What room have you for God in your life? What place have you given to him in all your plans? Because he may permit you, just like Naaman, to achieve great things, and he may give you abilities and skills to do it, but there is a day coming when the Bible says that God will require the deeds done in the body, whether they be good or evil. It is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. You see, my friends, sin had no known cure, but it was extremely regressive. People who had, had leprosy, when you saw them, they got worse and worse. Their fingers fell off, their hands fell off, their features of their face fell off. They never got better. And sin, whenever it is in an individual or in a community or in a nation, the nation always gets uglier and uglier, more deformed, more twisted, more perverted. That's what sin does. I'm sure many of you have heard people saying, if my grandfather or my father was back from the grave, what would he say? about the world we're in today. You see, people tell me today that we're a progressive nation. That's what my, many of the politicians, even in our land, are saying. We're progressing. We are a civilized nation. And we would be very quick to attack anything that the Nazis did because they were uncivilized people. 
because they took the Jewish people and they said, these are not people at all. These are not real persons. And they're really an inconvenience to society. And what we'll do is we'll, we'll bring them to some secret place where nobody knows about and we'll do them to death and we'll get well paid for it. We wouldn't be like the Nazis because we're a civilized society. But during our COVID lockdown, almost as many children have been murdered like the Nazis in different places in the province by butchers called doctors. And yet we say we are civilized. And the most innocent and vulnerable crying for their lives have been murdered in the wombs of their mother. And as a nation, we accept it and endorse it. And God's judgment will be on politicians who have endorsed it and stood by it for the wholesale murder of children in this land. No nation that kills its children is civilized. It's not civilized. It's a murderous regime under the guise of helping people. Jesus Christ never brought a life into this world to have them murdered. You see, my dear friends, when sin and wickedness and debauchery and lawlessness and the rejection of the Ten Commandments goes out of the mindset of a nation, the lights go out. The lights go out. And what have you got when you've got the ten lights out? Darkness. Gross darkness. You have men dressing like women. I've said to my wife often going down the street, you'd need a scanner today to know who's who. And it's endorsed in every advert on television. My friends, as the church of God, if you claim to be a Christian, and you claim to be following the Lord, and you claim to love Jesus, why are you not at the prayer meeting? Why are you not at the prayer meeting? You're sitting at home with your television and gossiping, and you're thinking how to make money. You couldn't care tuppence about those children. Or you'd be in the place of prayer and you would have your knee bent and you would be calling on God. Sin is ugly. Sin is ugly. And friends, you know what the devil does with sin. When it's done its full work in the life of an individual, it leads them, it leaves them that broken that shattered, that deformed, that perverted, that twisted, that it looks as though there's no hope for them. Man always goes downward, always. He never goes up. You can educate him. You can, you can, you can try your best with psychology and psychiatry, and you can do it all with man, and use every man-made means. But I want to tell you, man is on a trajectory downward, away from God. He goes to darkness, but the Bible says men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. And the only antidote to sin, the only antidote to sin is the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son. For the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. The hymn writer said, I know a fount where sins are washed away. I know a place where night is turned to day. My dear friends, it's at the cross where Jesus shed his precious blood and atoned for the sin of the world and took all the filth and all the perversion, and all the wickedness, and all the murder, and all the blasphemy, and all the sin of mankind, he took it all upon himself, and God punished him on the cross, and he died the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. He died for you, my friend. He died for you. Francis Alexander said he died that we might be forgiven. He died to make us good. 
that we might go at last to heaven saved by his precious blood. Oh, this man was a sinner. He was a sinner. And the Bible says your iniquities have separated between you and God. Your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. I want to tell you lovingly, my friend, that you are separated from your creator God. And you are not under his grace or his favor. God in his grace permits you to receive the sunlight and the showers, the same as the Christian. But I want to tell you that you're different in the spirit realm. Because the angels look on at you and they can see that you defy God and you live as though he does not exist. And you break his laws with impunity and you live as though there's no God to ever give an account to. And you have no thought of your moral compass. You have no thought of right or wrong. Your secret sins are supposedly secret. But I want to tell you all heaven knows what you're doing. All heaven knows what you're doing. Oh, yes, the angels look on in pity upon you. Ah, but there are dark, demonic devils that look on and they have their finger on you. They have their hold upon you and they're pulling you. And they're pulling you further and further into darkness, further and further away from God, further and further toward hell and the lake of fire. This man was sick with sin. But thank God he knew that he needed a remedy. You know, for sin, there's a remedy. And I want to tell you, I don't care what you have done tonight. I don't care what you have done. I don't care what you have said or thought or been involved in. The Bible says all manner of sin shall be forgiven unto men. All manner of sin. The blood cleanses from all, all, all sin. This man was aware of his condition. And he was evidently trying and thinking of how, even though he had his great wealth and position, this leprosy problem was there. My friends, you can't shake it off. The sin question is with you. The sin question is in you. The consequences of sin are upon you. He that believeth not is condemned already. You say, Alan, I don't feel condemned. You don't have to feel it. You're dead in sin. A dead man never feels anything. But it'll be a happy day in your life when you begin to feel your sin. I pray God the Holy Spirit come and convict you of sin. I pray God the Holy Spirit come and reveal to you your true nature before your own creator. I pray God that he come and pull the heavens back and let you see into that realm which is beyond the grave. I pray that he let you see the glory of heaven and the abyss of hell. I pray that God open your blinded eyes and that you see that your soul is in the balance and you're just a step between heaven or hell, whichever decision you make over Jesus Christ. In this man's home, there was a little girl, just a wee girl, and the wee girl had every reason to hate this man because she'd been taken captive from her own country, from her own mother and father as a wee girl and she was used as a slave in this man's home. But the wee girl knew that God had the answer. She knew that the God of Israel, of her people, that he healed diseases like this. That he was the answer to the problem. And so she spoke up. And she said to her master's wife, If only you would go to my country, the God of my country would heal you. I want to tell you that there's healing for you. You say, Alan, I don't need healing. Oh, yes, you do. 
Because we're all broken, every one of us. Broken through sin. Say, Alan, I'm in control of my life. No, you're not. Don't tell me you're in control of your life. Stop sinning. Stop sinning. Stop the addictive whatever's going on. Here. Stop it. You can't stop it. You can't stop it. Because sin is active in you. Because sin demands that you submit to it. Sin is like a great beast over your life. And it demands you will submit to me. It's like being in a ring. In a boxing ring. And if you were in a boxing ring, my friends, with one of the world's greatest boxers. And you were boxing them. And they were doing a good job. You went to go into the ring every time you go in, they batter the life out of you. That's what it's like with sin. You never win. Unless you can get someone who's stronger than your opponent. And you go to them and you say, would you come in and come into the ring with me and help me in the ring? And if you get that person to come in, then they can beat your opponent. I want to tell you the person who would come into the ring is Jesus Christ. And he's the king of kings and he's the lord of lords. And he has defeated Satan. He has defeated hell. He has defeated sin. He conquered them all at the cross. When he said triumphantly from the cross. It is finished. I have paid for the price of sin. I have defeated the devil. I have defeated the power of hell. And the way is open for men and women. Who will come to me by faith and repentance. To have a home in heaven. And I will take them there. It's a wonderful story. The little girl was the evangelist that told the story. The man started on his journey for healing. And I pray tonight, if you haven't already, that you'll begin the journey for salvation. You'll begin the journey to God, the God of Israel, the God and Father of the Lord Jesus. I pray that you will come to the Savior of the world, the one who bled and died for you on Calvary and rose again the third day so that you could have instant forgiveness and assurance of heaven and know that when you die, you will be absent from the body and present with the Lord in a wonderful country called heaven. I trust, my friend, that you're on that journey. But you know, as he went along and recognized he was sick, and started on the journey, he made a huge blunder. And many people do it. You see, friends, there are many people in Ireland, and they know they're sinners. There's many people today, Protestant, Catholic, anything at all, they know they're sinners. You don't need to convince them. They know they've got leprosy. They know they've got the disease. But like this man... They didn't know how to find the cure. Because the Bible says what he did was he thought to himself, I'll go to the king. The king will heal me. He's the boy with all power. He's the boy with influence. I'll go to him. And so they made off. And what else did he do? He not only went to the wrong man, but he brought the wrong equipment with him. You see, he brought gold. He brought garments. He, brought, he was going to pay for it. <laughs> he was going to pay for this. My friend, you can't pay for salvation. You can't pay to get into heaven. Not one brass penny get you to heaven. The Bible says it is without money. And it is without price. The Bible says no man can redeem his brother. For the redemption of the soul is costly. No, the Bible says for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works lest any man should boast. It is but a simple gift from the God of heaven to the sinner who comes. When you come to receive a gift, you simply put out your hand and with gratitude you say, thank you. My friend, that's how I became a Christian. That's how I got into the kingdom of God many years ago. As a young teenager, I put out my hand to God. I'd been a religious Presbyterian, trying my best, paying, praying, catechism, reading the Bible, trying to do my best. I'd done all that stuff. 
and yet I was as blind as a bat. I was rushing psalm singing, psalm singing, and I would have gone immediately to weeping and wailing from my church pew. But I heard a faithful evangelist, a faithful evangelist, who come to this community and told us that religion can't save, the church can't save, the good works can't save, that all the pain can't save. Oh, I'm so glad that there was a faithful evangelist. There was somebody sent by God to this community after being years in different churches where they told me if I prayed enough and if I gave enough and if I went to church enough that I would be all right. After all, I was baptized. But my friend, it's not true. It's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. The Bible says you're saved by the grace of God, by the mercy, by the kindness of a great loving God who chooses because of what Jesus done on the cross. He chooses to give us eternal life. And I well remember when I received it. I well remember. Happy day, happy day when Jesus washed my sins away. He taught me how to watch and pray and live rejoicing every day. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. He went to the wrong source. But you know what happened to him, friends? Whenever he eventually got his bearings right, he was told to go to Elisha, the man of God. When he came, he already recognized, I'm a sinner, I've got the, I've got the disease, and I want to be healed. I want to be made right. And he was doing the right thing now. And he came to the man who could tell him exactly how to be forgiven, how to be healed, how to be right with God. He got in touch with the right man. But he had one big problem. He was packed with pride. <laughs> he was packed with pride. And Elisha being the man of God and knowing God's heart, he knew the boy's problem. And so what he did, rather than going out to him with all his wealth and all his attire, he just sent out a wee messenger and he said, tell him to go to that old filthy river over there. And he said, tell him to get down into it three times and bury himself in it. Well, that wasn't good news. Filthy old river, full of dirt. And the boy was raging. <laughs> he was raging. And you know, sometimes before people become Christians, they berate him. They berate him. I have people on numerous occasions in gospel meetings, and whenever you preached, I can tell you they weren't happy bunnies. I remember a boy on one occasion today, he's an evangelist and he's a missionary. And he was a skinhead at the time. And I remember he came to the meetings and he sat and I was behind the pulpit and he was there and boy, he didn't like me and I knew it. And the more I preached, the less he liked me. And I thought to myself, well, I've got you in here for an hour and I'm behind the pulpit and you can't get at me, so I'm going to lob every bomb I have at you. And I took every text and every illustration I could think of to put the fear of God into him. And by the time I had the sermon over, I could see this semi-bald head down. And I knew I had got a good direct hit on him. And when he went out, he wouldn't even shake hands with me. Put the head down and went out like a rabbit out through the door. But a few nights later, when the meetings were over and we were sitting in the pulpit, having a cup of tea, then having a prayer meeting afterwards, the two doors threw open. I thought it was like a John Wayne movie. The, the two doors shut open and in come the boy. In come the boy. And I knew. And I ran over to the door and I opened the door and he walked in round and he started to cry. He started to cry. I said, what's your problem? He said, it's my sin. It's my sin. Ah, <laughs> oh, my dear friends, he came to the Lord that night. As I say, he's a missionary today. When God the Holy Ghost gets a hold of a man or a woman, they may feel angry at the start. 
They may, may take a real offense to the preacher. There may be a whole lot of things happen. But it doesn't matter. It's the work of the Holy Spirit to bring men and women to Jesus Christ. And I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe he convicts men of sin. I believe he saves men. I believe he transforms men. I believe he can break addictions. He can set people free. He can set demons out of their lives and fill them with the Holy Ghost and power and make them a blaze for God. I believe that. I believe that. My friend, if this thing didn't work, let me tell you, I'd be the first boy to, to preach against it. If I didn't believe Jesus Christ really came and died in, died in the flesh and rose again the third day and came back and went to heaven and sent the Holy Spirit, if I didn't believe in a literal heaven, literal hell, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. I'm not doing it for money. I'm not doing this for a month. I'm not doing this for a shilling. I'm doing this because it is duty on me from the Holy Ghost. Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Woe is me. My friend, my fellow Irish men, north and south, are dying and going into a Christless hell every hour, and the church in Ulster is sleeping. All their evangelicals, they're sleeping. And if ever there was a need for churches to open, at least to pray. At least to pray. To call on God. Let me tell you, the devil doesn't have a mask on. The devil, my friend, isn't hiding anywhere. He's not social distancing. He's putting people into hell every day. He's going after every person that's vulnerable at the moment. People with their mental health. People with cancer. People with other things. No, you'll not hear it on the BBC. But you'd hear nothing, nothing worth listening to in the BBC anyway. My dear friends, we don't get our orders from government. We get our orders from a higher power. And if you wait on God on your belly and you listen to God and you pray to God and you give your all to God and you honor God in your life, God will speak to you and that voice is greater and stronger and it's worth listening to more than all the world. All the world. My problem with our country is that most of the Christians are just listening to Stormont on the BBC. Not hearing God. Not praying. Not hearing the Master. That the Master longs to save. He longs at a time of epidemic whenever people are dying and going to hell that the churches would at least have a little interest. A little interest in the souls of men. Oh, well, my friends, he was full of pride. And he turned, talked about going to his own country and better water. But you know, the Lord didn't change it. You might say, well, I don't like the way of salvation. It's just by faith. I don't like it that way. Well, that's okay. You'll go to hell. You'll just go to hell. That's what will happen. God didn't change it. God didn't, 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 you don't need a, a deluxe, my friends. The gospel has always been the same from the days of the apostles. It's a simple message of the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ for the sins of men. Same message. God won't put it down or make it easier for you because he already has done everything for you. What he requires of you is to come, to come to him by a simple act of faith and acknowledge your sin. Say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Uh, this is my sinnership. I have broken God's law. I am guilty and I deserve to be punished for the sinfulness of my life. But I plead for mercy. <laughs> That's all you need to do. Cry out for mercy. There was a lion on one occasion and a little mouse ran over its back. The lion caught the mouse by the paw and he hung him up to eat him. The mouse said to the lion, please don't eat me. Let me go. I'll save you someday. The lion was very amused 
that the mouse would say it would save him someday. The lion said, you can't help me. But in humor, he let the mouse go. A few hours later, these hunters caught the lion. They tied him up and they left him there until they were coming back to cage him. The little mouse heard the roars of the lion. <laughs> and he came and he started biting at the ropes. And he bit through all the ropes. And he set the lion free. The lion had said, you couldn't help me. You're too insignificant to help me. The prophet said, dip three times, seven times in the water. Humble yourself. Do the little thing. Do the little thing. But how could such a little thing help me? He went down, my friend, seven times. And when he came up the seventh time, his skin was like the skin of a child. He was healed completely. He humbled himself. I'm closing now. I want to tell you, my friend, if you'll come and humble yourself and say to God, God, I, I'm a sinner and I'm guilty. But I long to be a Christian. And I want to follow Jesus Christ for the rest of my life. And I want to do his will. And I want to walk with him and talk with him. I don't know what it'll mean. I don't know much about church. I don't understand about a lot of the things you've been talking about. But in my heart tonight, I know I want to be right with God. And I want to live for God. And I want to be a real Christian. If that's the cry of your heart tonight, I want to tell you that God's very concerned to save you. And I want to tell you something that was told to me just before I became a Christian. The seeking sinner and the seeking saviour always meet. They always meet. He's looking for you. He's looking for you. Would you come to him tonight? Would you receive him?